Welcome to Conversations. This is your host, Michael Stone, and I am so thrilled about my guest today. This may be the best interview I've ever done, and uh, Dr. Irvin Laszlo is generally recognized as the founder of systems philosophy and general evolution theory. His work in recent years has centered on the formulation and development of the Akasha paradigm, the new conception of cosmos, life, and consciousness emerging at the forefront of the contemporary sciences. He serves as president of the Club of Budapest, chairman of the Irvin Laszlo Center for Advanced Study, chancellor of the Giordano Bruno New Paradigm University, and editor of World Futures, the Journal of New Paradigm Research. Twice nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize, he's published more than 75, actually I hear now it's 90 books and over 400 articles. I don't know how you do it, Irvin, but welcome to Conversations. It's lovely to have you. Thank you, Michael. It's, it's great to be here. So let's just jump in uh, and look at how the notion of reality is, is changing. We're moving from the worldview, the Cartesian, Newtonian mechanistic perspective into a quantum uh, theory of uh, evolution. How, how does that change reality? It doesn't change reality, it changes us. Changes, I mean, our view of reality, exactly. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> but it changes us very thoroughly because uh, our, our, uh, this is a completely different concept of the world. Of course, our immediate experience is what it is. You know, we experience a green dot or a red door, and uh, that's what we experience. But how we interpret it? You see, now we are, we are recognizing it now very widely in, in science and in philosophy of science that the data that we get the sensory data, or any experience that we have, is capable of many different interpretations. And what we do is, in Einstein's words, we work, word, words rather, uh, we seek the simplest possible explanation, mm. simplest possible comprehensive explanation, things that tie together what we observe. But the same sensations that give us a mechanistic world a, 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 a whole universe that is more like a rock than it's like a thought, which is the contrary has been said 100 years ago by some famous cosmologists. So even that, that word, that concept is now changing. It is, the world is not a mechanism, it's not like a rock. It's like a great idea, that a great thought, because everything is connected with everything else. And we are all very much a part of all this sphere of interconnection. So mm. we live in a different reality than that we thought we did. And our behavior or response to that reality changes correspondingly. Mm. So the field of epigenetics has shown that uh, it's not genes that determine who we are. And, um, and it's our perception and our beliefs that actually give us what we consider reality to be. What's the relationship between consciousness and reality? Well, first of all, it's not genes. The genes is like the keyboard of a piano, you know. Uh, they're capable of being activated in different ways and it gives you quite different, uh, different results. A simple fish has 95% the same DNA as the human being. You know? And the fruit fly has, has more genes than it has the human being. So we, we mustn't think in mechanistic, materialistic terms. This, uh, the epigenetic system, which is a system of how we conduct, how we play on the instrument, which is given by our genes. Uh, that is the key factor. And that epigenetic, epigenetic code or epigenetic system is changing from individual to individual, and so some part of it is even inherited. So we have to learn that we, our interpretation of the world, what we actually perceive, is very much dependent on our beliefs, on who we are, how we relate to the world around us, to other people around us. It doesn't mean that it's all subjective. It means that there are a great number of interpretations, of explanations are possible. And now we are seeking, well, we have always been seeking, but now we seek more consciously than ever, 
the simplest possible comprehensive scheme, things that can really pull together, tie together, explain what we observe. Mm -hmm. And our observations, of course, are much more, much wider than they've ever been. We can go down to the microcosm, up to the cosmos and to the macrocosm, and many, many other things in between. So it's an exciting endeavor, recognizing that the ancients were right when they said that what we perceive, what, what we perceive is very much dependent on what we want to perceive, on what we believe in. It is very true that not only do we perceive what we believe, we also don't perceive what we don't believe. So uh, it is a very complex world, but mm. it's very exciting world because we can recognize, we can find more and more aspects of it and we begin to know more and more of it. And it's becoming more and more a fabulous world, a living universe, which has so many aspects, so many, so many uh, contexts in which it can operate. So that we are now in the, in the midst of a revolution in our understanding of the world and of ourselves in the world. I think it's, it's brilliant the way the, the concept of living universe that the mystics have talked about uh, through time immemorial is now being shown to be exactly what's so uh, in the universe. And one of the things that I wanted to look at was for most of us, we consider the uh, consciousness to reside in the brain. That's the materialist point of view. But that's really changing with things like the morphic field and people talking about field of consciousness uh, that we're giving and drawing on it. Uh, so, uh, you know, at best, it, it seems that it only is partially uh, related to the brain. Can you talk about that relationship of consciousness and the brain and physical matter? Well, the old concept is, I like to use the term a turbine, like, a, like, a, like an electricity generating turbine. It works and as long as it works, it does something, it generates something, which is not it, not itself, not a part of it, but it generates another phenomenon. When the turbine works, you get electricity as an output. In this concept, when the brain works, that's a classical concept, when the brain works, it generates something which, is, which are sensations, feelings, uh, sensory data, and all this sort of thing. Uh, it generates consciousness, mind. You know. When the brain shuts down, then the mind, the sensations disappear, just like when this turbine shuts down, there is no more flow of electricity. And this made a lot of sense, since this was a sort of scientific explanation. The problem is that there was increasing evidence that the sensations, what we call consciousness or mind, do not completely shut down. Sometimes they don't shut down at all, and the brain is suspended and the brain is not operative. So it seems that brain, or like the, the consciousness can continue to exist even when the brain does not function. This is more like picking up a, a, a TV program, for example, a radio program from the air. You know, when we shut down our TV receiver or radio set, that program is still there, still goes on. Only our particular receiver doesn't get it, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't display it, but the program is still there. And it could be picked up by other, pro by other TV sets and radio sets. So there is more to consciousness than this functioning the workings of neurons in the brain. And that more means that consciousness exists in the brain, but it also exists beyond the brain. What does that mean in, in sort of in, in concrete, uh, uh, more, more understandable terms? It means that the brain is not a receiver, not a, a producer, let me call it that, not a produce, producer of consciousness, but a receiver and a transmitter. Mm -hmm. So it's, so it's both creator and participant in the creation, but it's, a, it's receiving from a larger field. We, of course, our brain also displays the information that our senses get, yes, undoubtedly. Mm -hmm. But there is much more to it. There is information that we sometimes call hunches or, 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 or intuitions. Mm -hmm. uh, this is information that we, we can pick up, and this is... Uh, has been often dismissed by the materialists as just imagination. 
But now we have evidence that information of this kind can be veridical. I have written a whole book together with a colleague of mine, Anthony Peake, called The Immortal Mind, which all full of, uh, uh, full of documented case studies of conscious experience existing and operating in the absence of a working brain. So uh, we, cannot no, we can no longer confine the workings of consciousness, the existence of consciousness to the brain. Mm -hmm. The brain is there to transmit it, to display it. The brain is a transmitter, a displayer, but not a producer. The, the, the consciousness is something that is as much present in the universe as energy. And mm -hmm. now this, as we say, as matter, and much more real than anything that we have called before anything material. Energy and information are the ultimate realities in this universe. And our consciousness is made up of this kind of an informed energy that is in the field, in the field which is this quantum universe, this quantum cosmos. And in that, we are picking up elements of it. We can go and talk about it much more detail about, about the uh, holographic theory and all that. But just to say for now that, that the evidence is overwhelming now that consciousness can exist also beyond the brain, not limited to the brain. So consciousness is much deeper, much more of a natural uh, fundamental phenomenon than what we have thought would be just this kind of a fleeting display uh, that we thought was produced by a brain. Well, I've had a personal experience of that myself. I died on an operating table uh, mm -hmm. and was dead for, uh, more than a minute uh, in terms of no vital signs, no life signs. And yet I was kind of like a convex mirror watching the whole thing from above and also knowing that I could completely leave or come back and I could tell you everything that was said uh, at the operating table when supposedly I was dead. So I, I have a personal experience of that myself. Well, Michael, that's amazing. That's wonderful. I've been, I've been looking for these experiences to quote. More and more of it comes through. Of course, one doesn't need to get so close to actually dying uh, to have these experiences. They, they can also occur in other states, in you know, altered states of consciousness. But that you have this first-hand experience, then you don't need to be convinced that it is true that consciousness is not simply a byproduct, it's a semi-product sort of, of, of a functioning set of neurons. It's much, much more to it than that. It's certainly motivated me for many years. So let's talk about, you know, in the mechanistic view, um, everything, you know, whatever's real is what can be measured, whatever has mass or form or is matter. So what is matter and where does it come from? I'm really interested in the vibrational theory and the, the packets of vibration, how they come together. I'm trying to understand that in your work. Can you explain that in a way that I might be able to understand it? Well, it's, it's a different look, way of looking at the world of what there is. But this way of looking at the world actually is based on the latest, most sophisticated observations that we can have. Observations that go beyond the brain, observations that go f deeper down than anything that we can per perceive as our sensory organs. So think of the world as a set of interconnected, coherent, resonant vibrations. Why that? Because you would think that when we go down and down and down to the smaller and smaller scale, these are instruments and these are various ways of computing what we, what we observe then, then you would find something which is rock bottom. And the rock bottom, we have assumed, the materials assumed, are, are elements, particles of matter. So there are bits and pieces that exist in different combinations. Democritus, the Greek uh, philosopher called it atoms. And he said atoms are the ultimate reality. Atoms are indivisible. Now we know that they're divisible. 
we now also know that when they divide atoms, we get we get the particles and the protons and the neutrons and the electrons and the and the, and the short-lived uh, whole zoo of of uh, remarkable particles. Uh, we know that all of these are ultimately nothing material, nothing hard, nothing permanent. They are swirls. They are like vortexes in a in a in a in a sea. They are but they also have a characteristic which is resonance, resonance, they vibrate with other resonances. So this was said already by many great scientists, uh, most remarkably, not a couple of decades ago by Max Planck, who explained that uh, ultimately the reality of the world is the set of vibrations of which make up the atoms, and he said, after all my work in the, in the field of science and the most hard-headed type of science, looking at, at atoms, I can tell you there is no such thing as matter. And because, because what we ultimately find are elements of a something which can be best expressed as resonant vibrations. And these things are interacting among themselves. They create sets, they, they come in sets. I would call them clusters. And when they are in, in phase, when they are well tuned together, then they give you the impression of being an entity. These resonant vibrations are make up something which ultimately we, can, we must recognize as a, a cluster of vibrations, well tuned together in phase vibrations of specific frequency and volume and amplitude. But ultimately, we don't find anything beyond that. Now, there's a, a nice cop-out in a way, say, okay, so it's probably the universe vibrates, or probably the, rather the, the material universe vibrates. There is something matter that vibrates, and we perceive the vibrations. Only when we take away the vibrations, we don't find anything. Mm. So you can't say that it is something which, is, which vibrates. We can say the vibration is it. That is what exists that is in the universe is a sea, an ocean of vibrations in various ways, harmonized, pulled together so that they create the impression of various things. They create at different frequencies, they create the impression of energy, pure energy. We know the frequencies of that according to the you know, square of the velocity of light. We get, we get also pure light, which is the velocity of light, you know. And then we had the, the material, seemingly material bodies, gets at 150 megahertz vibrations, and there are much lower vibrations as well. Vibrations that are picked up by the brain only at, at the very deep level of the, of the EEG spectrum of theta, or delta levels even. And they, get, they look like that, they are called often transcendental experiences. So what we have, and the, in the last analysis, is a sea of vibration, which is interacting, which is constantly joining together, constantly forming and reforming. Everything that happens enters into that sea of vibrations. Everything is enriching it in a way. It can be enriched positively, or it can be made less coherent, uh, because if, you are, if our vibration with which you enter into it is not consistent, not coherent with it, but it's there, basically. What is there is this mind-like, mind-like quantum system which interacts, which evolves, which joins together, which creates sets and clusters and makes us see the world, experience the world as energy, as field, as wisdom even, as information, and seemingly uh, many aspects of it as, as something, ma something material, mm. which I said in the last analysis, disappears. It's not there simply as material. Mm. So it's a remarkable universe, and uh, we are much more part of it, much more a living part of it than we ever thought that we could have been. Because in all materialist interpretations, the individual, the, the perceiver is outside. You, you look at it. You, you, are, you are just a, a witness, a spectator. But in the new concept, you yourself, we each of us are these clusters of vibration, which we, we interact with, we join together with all the vibrations that are around us, 
all the things that happen. Of course, it's a very complex way of talking all the time about vibrations. You can talk about events, you can think about entities, items, uh, particles, whatever, as long as you don't think that there's something ultimately underlying it, which is hard bits of pieces like, like little pebbles or rocks. Mm -hmm. What there is, is this interactive, holographically whole, interactive totality of sets of vibration clusters which we perceive as individuals, perceive as ourselves, as us, because we ourselves are clusters of vibration, we perceive as the rest of the world. But it's a different world. And I think it's a much more exciting world. It's a much more poetic world in a sense. But the reality is, the reality is not simple. Reality, you can make it and try to understand it as simply as possible. But Einstein also said that, he said, make it as simple as possible. He also added, but not simpler. <laughs> so the implications of this are, are startling and amazing. I mean, in a sense, you could say, I think, that we are then co-creators of the universe in this. And that, when you, when you talk about coherence, uh, you also break it down into implicit and explicit coherence. So it seems like we are not in harmony, individuals, hu the human species is out of harmony with the natural world, which would imply, I think, from what I understand, and by the way, I want to mention your new book, The Intelligence of the Cosmos, Why We're Here, New Answers from the Frontier of Science. Um, make sure that people uh, know that it's really um, a book to read more than once. So would you talk about this idea of coherence, because it's such a key issue, and, and, and how to be, uh, how, um, the, the difference between implicit and explicit, uh, our own, uh, say, if we're talking from an individual, our, uh, or an organization or a solar system, it, there's the implicit and explicit coherence. Can you share that with us? Well, just to pick it up from where we left it, what we can perceive as something, even though it's not a material thing, something in the world, is a set of vibrations which are coherent. Okay. Now, coherence is something that seems to evolve, that seems to emerge in this universe. When this universe was born, assumedly in the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago, according to latest estimates, uh, then there was a chaos. The first appearance was a tremendous energy burst in which there were no individual items, nothing, no, no individual particles even. Everything was a total super energetic chaos. And that, as the universe then settled down, cooled and, and, and became more coherent, more and more coherent to the extent where particles emerged, particles joined into atoms, atoms into molecules, into multi-molecular structures. Ultimately, planets appeared and in some of the planets, this, this coherence, organizing, coherence, generating a process has continued. So we are now at the point where there are, the universe is incredibly coherent. We find it more and more elements of it. Uh, you can even calculate it in terms of its, of, of its coherence. There is nothing, there doesn't seem to be anything that's totally outside of it. There's nothing completely unaffected by anything else so that there is no individual item which would be like an island. It's all joined together. It's all coherent, but not necessarily incoherent in such a way that it creates larger and larger coherent units. You can have decoherence in this world. Now it's interesting, I should add, that in nature, as far as we know, because there could be other uh, forms of life uh, that we don't know, but in, on this planet, Nature is intrinsically and, and, and intimately coherent. Nothing that is really truly incoherent will survive. All, any species, for example, that is not coherent with the surroundings will ultimately be, become extinct. 
we, we have to be coherent within ourselves. When we are, then we are healthy. That means that all the vibrations that make up are the cells of our body, all the organs and organ systems, they're all tuned together. And they are tuned for this ultimate, ultimate purpose or, or, or objective of maintaining that set of vibrations in the sea of vibrations, maintaining it as something individual. And that is, means that it maintains us, in this case, as, an, as a unit, as an element, as a living being. And uh, this coherence is, in nature, positive. It's always there. But when something happened, when a level of evolution was reached by the human being, whereby you have something like free will, appearing for free will, and, and the possibility of choice, then this famous thing that I mentioned, we mentioned a while ago, about interpreting what, what we know, what we, what we experience. This could be done in different ways. We could see things in different ways, and some of the ways that we see them were not corresponding to what they really is. We could see them as, as we, could, we could become a sea, we could become a source of incoherence in the world. And that becoming, becoming that a, a non-evolutionary, sometimes anti-evolutionary uh, element in the world is contrary to the whole evolutionary trend, to the whole coherence, a generating universe around us. And to be coherent, as you yourself have just said, means being coherent internally and externally, intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsically means health bodily organic health because all our cells all our molecules everything that is goes into our body is coherent with every other that means coherent means in this case that it responds to it is finely tuned with all the other things so what happens to one cell of one part even of a cell is resonating with all the other cells with all the other parts of the cells it's all one system highly intertuned system when any part of it is not resonating and not responding, then it's disease, then it's an illness. The ultimate type of illness in this respect, or probably in every respect, is when this set of non-resonating, independent bent, independent bent uh, group of cells only generates itself, only is stuck in a mode of behavior which only replicates itself. That is cancer. But other elements, when just a group of cells do not work well, do not pick up the information from the rest, are not really coherent with the rest, that's also disease. There are various kinds of disease, from the simplest disease of just having a sticky nose and, 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 and a scratchy throat, uh, all the way to these fatal diseases. It all means breaks in the coherence of the organism. Mm -hmm. This is the internal coherence. But we mustn't forget the other side of the coin. If we don't act and join together with the world around us, with other systems, with nature, because we are part of it. If we don't act like it, if we don't promote that, then we are digging our own grave, practically, literally. Mm -hmm. Because then we have become inco incoherent with the world. And our incoherence means bad health for us and a, and a negative influence on the world around us. Other people, nature, everything else. Now we know that we are destroying even the balances of, of, of the planet. We're showing on the, we're seeing it on the on climate change. We see it on aridity. In so many ways, we are creating incoherence because we are free to do that. By free, I use in quotation marks. We have the freedom to mistake what is around us, to reinterpret and misinterpret what there is around us. And that freedom is a dangerous one. We have to go beyond it not to eliminate our freedom. We can't do that anyway. Once you have crossed this threshold of being able to think of your own and interpret what you see in your own way, we can't go back again. But what we can is rediscover the truer nature of our world, of our entity, of our being in the world. How do we relate to the rest of the world? Rediscovering it, that means becoming coherent with the world around us. Now, both of these elements of coherence, internally and externally, becoming a whole system, whole, healthy, in many languages, whole and healthy come from the same root. And also at the same time, 
because being coherent, being healthy as a healthy organism in a healthy environment, as a positive aspect, as a positive element of the world around us, with the external coherence. Becoming coherent socially, ecologically, psychologically, in every respect. Because we are not separate from the world, we are very much a part of the world. And together we create a world that has this higher level of coherence, external as well as internal, which in a nice scientific expression, which I like to use, is called super coherence. Mm -hmm. Super coherence means fully being tuned to ourselves and to the world around us. And nature, it seems to me the, the universe is evolving toward that direction, in that direction. And we can somehow even conclude that that evolution may be the purpose of the existence of the universe as a large philosophical uh, interpretation because that's how the world seems to evolve picking up more and more elements of coherence the universe itself is physically highly coherent the planet the biological processes are highly coherent healthy individuals are coherent with the world around themselves now we can also be unhealthy we can be sick we can be a negative factor and then we are a danger to ourselves and to the world around so the big lessons are here to recognize that we are part of the world, we are interacting with the world, we co-evolve with the world, and only by doing that are we healthy and are we whole and are we a positive aspect of the world. Hmm. It, it's so amazing, Irvin. I, I, I'm so struck by the similarities to, as someone who studied shamanism and ancient um, uh, texts for a long time, the, the parallel, say, to the indigenous or shamanic point of view of um, soul loss and essence. They, they fit so much into this, this whole theory. We have a loss of essence, a loss of soul, and or we're incoherent or decoherent, I think is another term that you used, uh, with the universe and with nature. And so when we look at this, the very key questions that you ask in your book, The Intelligence of the Cosmos, is who are we and where are we going? What's happening here? In a, in a lay language, uh, uh, from my perspective, is what's really excited is we're going somewhere. There's a, there's a directionality to uh the universe um talk about that who we are where we're going and the direction of that the the push towards uh the super uh, coherence i probably well, used wrong right. terms i'm sorry you know I'm, that's I'm, correct I'm, that's, are you absolutely 100 1000 percent right <laughs> uh, let's remember this up to very recently, in fact, still today, the mainstream, the conservative mainstream of science insists on an interpretation which says there is no higher or deeper purpose in the world. Everything is a series of chance interactions. When you sort of, you have a soup with many different elements, you keep stirring it, and sooner or later the universe emerges. A series of chance interactions, that's all there is because it's very convenient for science, science, science and for scientists not to be bothered by factors that are not easy to pin down, such as there being a higher will, a volition, a purpose, something like this in the world. Rather to say everything is just happening. That's the way it happens to happen, and it creates the universe. The problem with this is that what is there, what is happening, is so complex that chance interactions are very, very unlikely, uh, astronomically, <laughs> super astronomically unlikely to create this universe. You know, the, uh, the mathematical physicist um, Fred Hoyle once calculated uh, how long it would take, what, what it would take to unscramble the Rubik cube, you know, Rubik cube where you turn these six mm -hmm. faces mm -hmm. into the cube. And if you start from any random configuration and you ask yourself how, how many uh, how, how long would it take to reach, to be certain to, that you reach the uh, fully aligned configuration of all six sides, all the colors? And, it, and if you take, assume that it would take one second per move every 
twist that you give to the to this Rubik cube, how long do you think it would take? It would take longer than the age of the universe. There are just so many possibilities. Mm. On the other hand, which is a nice example also for something else that we talk about, to talk about information and coherence. On the other hand, if you get feedback after every move, every twist, that uh, is it, does it bring you closer to the alignment of all sides or, or not? If you get that information, on the average, you can do it in 120 different, 120 moves, which means by one second a move, which means in two minutes. So information switches, changes the scene from two minutes to more than the age of the universe. Now, what I'm trying to say about this is everything around us is so complex and so many different alternatives to it that to reach the point where it is and to be able to stabilize that at a given point and further evolve, become more and more coherent is astronomically, super, super astronomically unlikely to be a product of chance. It's not by mistake, not coincidentally. So evolution does have a direction, a directionality, if you like. It is something like that is underlying it. We can't say who by who is that person. Not in the universe. It's not in space and time. It acts on the universe. that uh, what acts on this universe in science can be conceived as the laws of nature. The laws of nature in their ensemble, together all the laws of nature, create the universe that is that is we live in, create us. Now, if this is not as a, a, a random creation, if it's more than just chance, then you can say the laws of nature testify to a higher purpose, a higher objective, which is unfolding as evolution in the universe. I'm not alone to say that. Einstein was saying this, you know, Jung was saying that, Schrodinger, all the great scientists are saying that. When you conceive of the laws of nature, when you conceive of the universe as it is, you can't keep the conclusion. There is something at work there, which is a higher mind, a higher consciousness, a higher spirit, if you like something which is a design but not a material material mechanistic design not a machine that is made to work by a program but is something that is emerging through those incredibly complex interactions by the way there's a very nice similar likewise by the physicist Fred Hoyle uh, talking about the possibility that evolution biological evolution would work uh, as a, as a uh, as a series of inter of uh, casual interactions he said that the probability that a new uh, organism would evolve by a chance mixing of the DNA, even of a fruit fly, even of a relatively simpler organism, the probability is similar to that of a hurricane blowing through a scrapyard assembling a working airplane. <laughs> that is not excluded, but it is astronomically improbable. This yeah. world is not the product of chance. And once it's not the product of chance and if there is evolution in it, a given direction, then you must say the direction in which this universe evolves must be the purpose that's underlying it. Mm. It's, of course, a philosophical interpretation, but it's the simplest possible interpretation of the facts. So, Urban, let's, let's bring this home for our listeners because... This, you know, we're, we're talking, it's somewhat abstract, but this has real consequence for the way we live our lives, the way we wake up in the morning and see the world, the way we speak and the way we listen, the way we create businesses, the way our relationship to truth, to beauty, to order in the world, it has such far reaching implications. How, how, how do you see the, the um, uh, expression of this uh, becoming more coherent affecting us because we we need more people to to grasp this and to understand the implications of what you're saying or the 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 alternative is we're we're self we will become 
uh, self-destructive and, and obsolete and um, uh, we will be gone on this planet and we'll take uh, quite a bit of life with us, but life in the universe will continue to go towards coherence. Well, also the ancient teachings have been telling you, don't look for the truth or for instruction from the outside. Mm. Some of them are saying it comes from a higher level or from a deeper level, but certainly it's not, in, not disconnected from us. The information, the instruction, the wisdom is in us. And here, to avoid being too sort of as, seemingly esoteric in this respect, we can specify the information in the world. In other words, the instructions, what are laws of nature are instructions. How to, how to behave for, for, for particles of, of, of elements of what you used to call matter, how to behave, is the instructions. So everything is basically information. And this information is not separate, is not separable, it's a totality. Now, you, you might think this is, this is just hopelessly, just speculative, but the, the explanation is basically simple and understandable. The information in the world, the, the intelligence of the cosmos, which is the title of my new book, uh, is a hologram, a hologram. That means that every, it's all parts, all the information is there in every part of it. We are fully receiving the information of the whole universe. We cannot display it, we cannot fully grasp it, but it's there, not only in our brain, in our every cell, it's there in us. And we must be able to contact it a little more. We must be able to receive it, to be tuned more to it, to, to live in a healthier life in which we are healthy as individuals, healthy as social beings, as, as, as planetary beings, as members of this, of this plan, uh, interplanetary community of life that I'm sure is in the world. So the teaching is in us, go back, not just to sit around contemplating your navel, but to recognize that we, each of us, is very much a part of each other and the world around us. And if we harm anything, if we destroy anything, then we destroy and harm ourselves. Mm -hmm. And this has many concrete in, uh, implications. For example, the latest insights that are coming from population biology, evolutionary biology. It used to be thought that Biology, according to the Darwinian, classical Darwinian model, is based on competition and it's the survival of the fittest. It turns out that not to be the case. That is also an element in there. There's an element of competition, obviously. But it's always within a larger system. And the larger system is a highly cooperative system. Even in the food chain in nature, the coherence of the system in which that food chain is taking place is maintained. It's when it goes out of bound, when it becomes chaotic, then the system breaks down, and then it, everybody has, has, has a problem, then there's a you know, the survival, even extinction problems. So cooperation, not, instead of uh, competition, competition. Mm -hmm. competition within limits, but cooperation, maintaining the coherence of the whole system, feeling ourselves to be part of that, and therefore not randomly, random, not, not in, a, in, a, in a disconnected, uh, uh, unthoughtful way, destroying or, 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 or disregarding other things. Never think of yourself as being alone there, as being the one, the one to, that counts, and the rest, the devil take the rest. That kind of thinking ultimately avoids, ultimately destroys the individual who thinks like that. And thinking like that in a nation, in a country, has led to the First and Second World War, you know, very clearly expressed in the saying in Germany before in, in the dawn of the Second World War, which is that Germany above all, Deutschland über alles, you see. Yeah. And that's very dissimilar from the idea that our country is the one that we have to go first with. Because it's f not, not just first, but together. Togetherness, wholeness, the expressions that we nowadays are using in the youth cultures of love, of unconditional love, not loving because you want to get something out of it, but love because you know that is your part, that is your role, that is your nature to love, to embrace, 
to hold together just as the, uh, the, uh, the proton and the neutron are held together and the nucleus of the atom, which Max Planck said is something like, a, like an intelligence, something like a mind in, 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 in the universe. That same holding together things is very much part of us and it's expressed in everything that we do when we act coherently, when we act as part of the world in which we live. So many, many implications. They are not new. Only we find the idea of a mechanistic universe where you play games and you kind of, you know, in even a metaphoric sense, and then the winner takes all. Those things simply don't exist. They don't work in the world. That's not mm. how it works. Mm. You either make it together or none of us makes it. Thank you. So, Irvin, we're getting close to the end of our time. And I guess the question that I'm sitting with is, if all of the ins information in the universe is available, I mean, I journey and do things like that to try to open myself, but what's stopping us from receiving this information and how can we cultivate our body and mind and soul into becoming a receptive instrument to the information of the cosmos? Well, that is perhaps a very simple, seemingly simple key to that. The fact is that not only do you believe what you, not only do you see what you believe, but you also don't see what you don't believe. Mm -hmm. If you have a wrong worldview, a materialistic reduction, a so-called reduction, so you do only this, nothing else, you know, in the world, mm -hmm. then you don't see the rest. You don't even perceive the evidence for it. Mm -hmm. We literally can create our own reality, and that can be a very impoverished reality, restricted than the real reality around us. So the first is to open up. Start be open to the possibility that you can perceive much more than what is just around you, what you can touch with your hand, or what you can perceive immediately with your eyes. That you, this is the task of science and of philosophy and spirituality as well. But this it means that recognize that this is an interconnected, self-evolving quantum universe in which we are one cluster of vibration among the others, interacting, making the world, world, world evolving the world either towards coherence or creating, creating pockets of decoherence. You know? Which, is, which means that those pockets of decoherence will disappear, this, those vibrations disappear. And that means those clusters that are created by the vibrations will, will vanish as well. So to live, to survive, and to flourish means to be coherent. Mm. This is the way to health. This is the way to a positive life. Mm. And it's all in us. Recognize that, yes, if you are open to it, you can perceive not all of it, of course, we can't perceive all of the information that, that under the universe runs, but we can perceive much more of it. And we can have a sense, a guiding, guiding intuition of who we are and where we are going. It's not so difficult. It seems a, a very far out kind of thing that we are a cluster of vibrations in the universe, no? Yes, but we are something that evolved together in this sea of vibrations, and we are evolving to, toward coherence, and we are co-evolving with the others. And if you recognize this, then we can be an, a, an agent of this co-evolution. We can be a positive factor. And I can't think of anything as could be a higher or, more, or deeper goal, uh, objective, task in our life than to live up to that possibility mm. of becoming coherently one with each other and with the world around us. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. Irvin, thank you so much. I feel, um, you know, what you're saying for me is about being integrous. It's about the wholeness and, and integrity within ourselves and our relationship to the world. Uh, it's, it's such an exciting time to be alive. And, you know, with all the institutions and things that are breaking down environment, there's just big road signs that say we need to view the world in a different way than we've been viewing it. Exactly. And uh, I'm so grateful for 
for you taking the time uh, to be with us here on Conversations. And uh, I look forward to staying in touch and, and hope we will have another discussion sometime. Thank you, because what you are doing is with these programs, raising these questions, discussing it, is paving the way for the kind of a deeper understanding that is the salvation of humanity, that is the way to health mm -hmm. and to flourishing. So you're doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Irvin Laszlo, thank you so much. Much love and gratitude and appreciation for your many years of service to humanity and the cosmos. Thank you very much, Michael. <laughs> Talk to you again.